Welcome back to The Dad Chronicle. I'm your host, I'm Alex Albisu, and this is episode 56. As always, you can visit thedadchronicle.com to listen to other inspiring stories of fatherhood, and you can become a patron by clicking the Become a Patron button at the very top there. Every dollar will go towards the operational costs that uh, are required for a show like this. Like I've mentioned, I don't do this for the money, I do it to share inspiring stories of fatherhood to those who might need it, but it goes a long way to helping me continue to make this show possible. And for today's guest, we have an old friend of mine. His name is Brandon Flanagan. If you guys live in the Virginia area, you likely had his beer. He is a brewer or formerly a brewer. I guess you're still a brewer, right, Brandon? Yeah, I still I still brew stuff. <laughs> yeah. You, you you're still you're still dabbling in it, but we're going to talk about how life changed for you and what that means to you. So, Brandon, you chimed in there. Why don't you say hi to the nice folks at home? Hey, everybody. How's it going today? Well, thanks. Wait for the response that's coming, right? Yeah, yeah. Just just hold on. The carrier pigeons are coming. Uh, thank you so much for being on this show. I've always been a big fan of your work, a.k.a. your beer, um, and just having conversations with you. Um, so, yeah, always so, good to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. You've been a guest on our show, The Geek 30 Happy Hour, back in the day, and uh, really appreciate you taking time to talk about fatherhood, something very near and dear to both of us. So why don't you take a second to introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, so uh, my name is Brandon. I was, was kind of born and raised in, in the area that uh, that I'm in now, which is the Northern Virginia area. And um, I met my wife here, and we went off to college in Nebraska. Um, when we got back, we kind of entered the workforce, started doing that whole thing. And uh, somewhere along the way in my marketing career, uh, moving up through the the career ladder, we got the crazy idea to to start brewing. My wife bought me a homebrew kit. And, uh, was we that like, like Christmas hey, morning? Like you're, you're like, oh man, I get to make my own beer. How did that yeah, feel? It was, it, yeah. So it was for my birthday and it was something where like, I'm not a guy that's like, oh, let me try this. Let me try this. Like, let me go all in. Like the first thing I'm going to buy is like all in. So like, I didn't start with this <laughs> beer. I was like, let me get a all grain kit. Let me do everything. Heck so yeah. It was, a lot, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, obviously that, that snowballed into a, a career for, for five and a half years for me. Yeah, that's really great. And why don't we talk a little bit about your family? Do you want to introduce them? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so obviously, my, um, myself and my wife, uh, Kimberly, and then we've got uh, two sons. Our oldest just started uh, kindergarten this year. He's Connor. He's five, and our youngest son, uh, Liam, he is now. You know, when they're fresh, you always had to think: is it weeks? Is it months? How do I want to do it? He was born October fifth, so I think we're right around four months now. Wow, man! So, are you sleeping? You know what? This is the this is the joke that we always say. Like, Connor never slept. He was a terrible sleeper. He was good at naps and never slept through the night. This kid is like the kid that we never believed existed. So, like, we put him down. I don't know, probably an hour ago or so, and uh, and I'm not going to see him again until four o'clock in the morning. Wow! No way. Yeah, it's just at it's four just months old. It. Yeah. Dude, that's beautiful. Oh my yeah, gosh. And he 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 wakes up, he changes a diaper, chugs a bottle. See you in see you in an hour. So Yeah, he's just he's, out then. He, oh my god. That's great, man. Holy cow. So what what's what's the secret? Is it just he's a different kid? Well, you know, we're always telling ourselves like, you know, it's because it's because the second kid like he's got a he's just a more relaxed kid. But you know, it's like we're just more relaxed parents, you know. You know, I remember, that's true. Uh, yeah, you could see, I could I, see that being a thing. I remember with Connor, like when he was, he was, a, anytime he would move around or make a noise in his crib, we were going in there and checking on it. And now it's just like, oh, you know, let's just wait until he's really screaming. And that must mean he really needs us. So, I, you know, I don't know if that has made him more of a, a calm kid and maybe we coddled the first one too much or. Who well, knows? to be fair, like, I mean, your first kid, you don't know really what you're doing. You're just like, the kid cries, I got to respond, right? And Yeah, right. Well, and of course, so so having this one be a sleeper the first night that he slept more than like six or seven hours straight, we were like, well, yeah, he's dead. Let's go in and check on him because it's over. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we got was the outlet. You guys use that? You know what that outlet? is? Outlet? Yeah. Like, a, like an owl? Oh, oh. We, I think we had that for the first one. Is that like the pad that you set under the... It's it's like a thing no. that you well you attach it to their foot so you uh, you wrap it around their oh, foot okay. and it basically monitors their heartbeat 
and it will alert you with like a loud chiming noise or actually no it plays um it plays a song but like it's like real loud it's jarring and right. uh, basically it basically tells you either it doesn't sense a heartbeat or it the, the kid is like gasping for air something something bad is happening and it gives you an opportunity to respond rather than waking up in a panic every 2 hours thinking crap is the kid still alive is the kid still alive is the kid still alive so- so that sounds really similar. We had a product. And I remember hearing of that. Now we had a product with Connor that was like a, a mat that he laid on that somehow detected it went under the sheet maybe, or under the mattress. Yeah. We weren't sleeping a lot back then. I really don't remember, but anyway, you stuck it under the mattress and that somehow detected whether or not he was breathing. And it's just like, how do people do it for hundreds of years without all this fancy technology? Oh, I know. I, they, they just did. They just were constantly stressed out. That's what I'm. Con- that's I'm convinced that everybody was just constantly stressed out. Yeah, or they just that, accepted that, the fact, you know. Yeah, or there's like, eh, he'll live or not. It's we'll see. We're, we're, we'll we'll, have we'll just make another one. It'll be fine. Yeah, because yeah. there's no such thing as birth control. We just kind of keep on having kids anyway. Uh, right. That's exactly. A, that's a terrible morbid thing to say, but um, it's kind of it's kind of true of the time, to be honest. Um, yeah. But you know, one thing that uh, that we've talked a little bit about, and, and that I I'd like to learn a little bit more about genuinely, is around Liam. So you have, uh, we'll we'll get into what it's like to to kind of go from career to now stay at home dad, which is sort of the transition that you went through. Why don't you give us kind of the lowdown of Liam's health situation. Yeah. So, um, I, I, honestly, the best way to describe it is, um, kind of, kind of give you, if you don't mind, I'll go through kind of quickly the story of, yeah, of please. his birth, which is, which is how we found out. Um, so when he was, um, so he was born, everything was fine for the first 12, 14 hours. Um, and then we kind of woke up or the doctor came by that next morning and all the dads out there, you know, like the doctor comes by and checks the baby and, you know, every every shift changed just make sure everything's okay and the doctor was just like you know is he's using like his whole abdomen his chest his stomach to breathe it's really labored that's that's unusual and we had gone to a brand new hospital that's really close to the house it doesn't have a, a NICU or anything but we were like yeah you never you need this right um so luckily we're in a great area as you know um, the hospitals here are excellent. So they had us on a video conference with the local NICU um, very quickly. And they had a doctor that was monitoring his situation. And he had a couple of episodes where he just stopped breathing. And they couldn't figure out if that was because, oh my God. because of uh, an obstruction or because of um, a brain signal not being sent to, to breathe. Um, kind of what are the two, what are the reasons it's not happening? And then decided for whatever reason, his brain is deciding not to breathe. So let's let's send him over to – and it's not constant. It's only you know three or four episodes, and then they kind of stir him, wake him up, and, and he's fine. So we go to the – we had to do the, the thing that you always fear, which is my wife is staying in Hospital A, and I'm going with my son, and we're rushing to Hospital B because that's where the, the NICU is. Oh, oh my so gosh. So like, you had to sep- they had to separate at that point because your wife was still recovering? Yes, and we had the option of. They were telling us they were like, "You can go there, but nothing's going to happen. You need to stay here. The nurses will make sure you get some sleep. You can recover. Your husband's got your son." So that's what we ended up doing. Um, so when what it was went that, over to the hospital, what was that like for you? Now going to that other hospital with your son, leaving your wife. How did you feel about all that? You know, it's. Um, I remember the moment that we had to, that we knew that decision was coming. It, so I, I suspect most of the guys out there do the exact same things we did. Like you, you go hospital shopping, right? Oh, yeah. And that's one, of, that's one of the things that you're thinking about, right? Like, wow, this hospital is really nice and it's a community hospital, but they don't have a NICU. They don't have a um, intensive care unit for kids. They don't have a, a pediatric surgeons on staff. And is that something you're okay with? And, and everyone's going to make that decision based on, themselves and their insurance and whatever reason for our first kid we went to a great hospital that had everything and we never needed it for this one uh, the way around um and i just remember looking at each other and we were just like well i mean we just kind of started crying i mean it's just like well yeah this is what's going to happen i'll uh call you later i oh, guess god that's got to be so hard yeah it, it, it was just like uh yeah, no, it wasn't. 
you had enough time that it wasn't like he's not he was never in, in a situation where where he's crashing if you will he's not okay like you know so as much as like we don't know why this keeps happening and we're not going to send him home with you until we know when he stops breathing so and when he would um, stop breathing what would they do do you know um i don't know if this, this is everyone's interpretation of hospitals or just mine but you you always seem to get all of your information afterwards yeah um so they would say they stimulated um so it wasn't like cpr but it, it also wasn't a chest rub it was a pretty good like uh, tap on the chest apparently is what they're doing they're really somewhere between like getting a little bit of movement going in his chest and waking him up like okay. a, a good in between firm wake up tap if you will so it, it's not sleep apnea it is very much apnea um that's happening while he was while he was awake but they just couldn't figure it out ended up um so so yeah well, i mean my, my my wife and i are sitting there um and we just kind of she was sitting on the bed and it was like okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna go now we just kind of held each other looked at each other cried a little bit and was like i'll talk to you later what i mean what else can you say right yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we went over, and uh, the worst part uh, for me was because it was a NICU transfer, they have to have a special transport team for that, including a NICU nurse, which has to be in the ambulance the whole time. And I guess because of whatever size ambulance they sent, um, there's no room for a parent. Oh, God, really? Yeah, so because because it's a NICU transfer, they sent them over in this big ET-looking cage. You know, oh. like it was the size of a stretcher and it's got this big incubator box and everything else on it. So like he's all hooked up to all that stuff with the transport team plus the NICU nurse. So with all of that, there's no room for me. So they're like, you're going to have to drive yourself. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Oh, oh man, I would be a freaking wreck, man. How did, you, <sighs> how did you hold up through all that? Um, You know, it was OK. It was um, honestly for the next couple of days, it was really it really just felt like. I'm just, you, you're just going to go through the motions because that's what's next, you know? So like, I didn't think about anything other than like next step is get to the hospital. And then, uh, I remember, ah, man, I remember so much, man, there's no way we're making this under a fun, easy time limit for you. But that's I fine. remember getting to the hospital, I remember getting to the hospital and I remember having, um, man, I, I haven't talked to too many people about this. So I remember getting to the, to the, uh, where the hospital was. And the problem is, you know, the hospitals, they have an ambulance entrance and right. I'm not allowed there. So oh. I had to find a place to, I had to find a place to park. And Alex, I don't know if you remember, I drive a, a very large vehicle. Right. Um, so of course I'm, I can't park in a parking garage. So I just you know drove up on the grass somewhere at the hospital. And parked <laughs> oh my, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. It's little stuff like that where it's like, Oh yeah, I can't just park in your convenient parking garage here. Great. Yeah, um, well, and also like the fact that you can't just pull up where the ambulances pull up. That's that's a really good point. Yeah, well, because because now he goes to the NICU as opposed to the ICU, which is different in this hospital. And this hospital is under construction, so all, like all the signs were were you know construction entrance signs, ambulances this way, emergency room this way, construction ER. Like oh, it's just so crazy. So um, so I get there, and I remember um. For the first couple of people, I was able to. I'm, of course, I'm just running the door on adrenaline. And for the first couple of p people I found, I was kind of like, "My son just got transferred here. He's in the NICU. I have no idea where that could be." And the I I was blessed along the way by so many people that helped us out so many ways. Um, and I remember this guy, or this lady was like, "Okay, what you're gonna do?" You're going to go through these doors. You're going to walk around here. And then I can see that the guy with her just looked at me and goes, sir, come with me. You won't be able to come this way again, but I can get you to your son. And I was oh, like, God bless Thank him. you. Thank you. And I, I don't even know. Like, we went through a kitchen at one point. Like, I don't really know what happened. But all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm, on this, I'm on this elevator and I get out and the NICU's right in the, uh, This NICU area is right in front of me. He's like, okay, you're going to go talk to the nurse. And, um, I was great right up until this point. So I get there and it's, it's a fairly secure area, obviously uh, with, with all the kids and infants around. Right. So when I, when I go to kind of try and figure out where the NICU is, I go up to the nurse and it was kind of like, Hey, I'm, uh, and this is, I just remember losing it. Like, um, I'm looking, I'm looking for my son. I don't, I don't know where he is. And it was, it was just, just trying to get that sentence out. was just the hardest thing that I've had to do. Hmm. 
um, just because it was just I just felt so helpless. It was a summation of of not really being able to help him and not knowing where he was and just kind of uh, did he just kind of having so much. Did did they react any sort of way to kind of seeing you in that condition? And were they really yeah, receptive she, to that? She was she was great. She was just like. Okay, give me. She's like, give me some more details, and I was like, he was transferred. She was so she was able to ask which hospital he came from. Okay, I know where he's at. Come with me. Um, and it was great. I, everyone in the NICU was excellent because they could tell right away that it was like, okay, your dad, come in here, get your hands washed, do all that stuff. But like, look through the window. There's your son. Yeah. Oh, so like, God bless him. So like, so we're gonna start there. Yeah. And now and now you can wash your hands and I'll do all this stuff. We'll get you scrubbed up. Now you can hold them. And now we're going to sit down and we're all just going to have a talk. And they were they was just so helpful. They, they did great. They were clearly used to dealing with with uh, people in that condition. What sort of things did they do to kind of help calm you down? Um, I mean, the first thing they did, luckily, was um, I, I know throughout the whole process, one of the things that we find with the hospitals and then what we're finding with what we're doing now is as we're stepping up with intensity, obviously we're getting better and better care. Um, so one of the things that was really nice about the NICU is they keep a doctor there all the time. And I, I had never gone to a NICU, so I don't know what I was expecting. It wasn't very large. Um, the room where all the babies were plus the offices plus, I mean, it, it wasn't more than maybe 15 or 17 square feet. I mean, it wasn't very large oh, space wow. at all. But um, there was a doctor there always, along with nurses and a couple of Clintex uh, technicians, not to be putting anybody down. It was just nice to have to have the doctor right there saying, OK, here's what we've got. And it was the same doctor that we had um, video conferenced with from the previous hospital. Oh, cool. So, OK, that's great. So, yeah. So that really helped us connect the dots of like, hey, I'm so and so. We talked on the phone. Now we're here. And then what happened so, yeah. when they when you actually sat with them? Uh, what's what sort of conversation was that? Well, so I uh, it, we we started developing a whole lot of I don't knows. Um, so that was a really quick time for us. We got there, we got to the um, we got to the ER or we got to the NICU, and the doctor said, "Okay, so we've got these apneic episodes. They're not frequent." And I say I say episodes. I mean, we're talking four. I mean, we're not talking a lot we're talking four or five instances where he has just not breathed or chosen not to breathe without stimulation My but of God. course i don't want that to happen at home. so they're so they said that's fine this happens with kids sometimes our policy is we keep them five days after the last episode we keep them here in the NICU. okay great and um, the whole time we're getting that you know what this just sometimes this happens with kids he was early he wasn't really early i think he was like 10 days early you know um, so everyone just kept telling us like, oh, this happens. It happens. It happens. It's like, okay, great. And then, um, the other thing that they noticed shortly after he was born was he also had a murmur. We had a car, uh, there was a, a pediatric cardiologist that just makes his rounds in the, in the NICU. So he took a list and he says, yeah, he's got a mi minor heart murmur. Um, I mean, if there's some liquid moving around, um, but, uh, um, that that's pretty, pretty common normal. though. Yeah. I was about to say, yes, that's pretty common. It, it's very common. It normally heals up one. after. Yeah. Yeah. Normally heals up in a couple of days, um, like pretty quick. Okay. Also, no big deal. Sounds great. And then um, while we were there, be, they still hadn't had any, any other symptoms. So we're sitting here going, okay, we are in checkbox mode. It is time to check the boxes and go home. We're just going to go five days without a breathing episode, and we're going to go a couple of days without, uh, you know, within this murmur is going to go away, and then we're done. Like we are all set. Um, so they have a um, ultrasound tech coming by to look at one of the baby's brains. Um, so while they were there, it was like, well, let's go ahead and throw one on um, for Liam, too. So they went ahead and did that. And we met with the um, pediatric neurologist who was on call. Um, and he kind of we kind of looked at the pictures and he was like, this looks like a, a little bit of a bleed down near the base, uh, the bottom of the brain. It's not incredibly common, but it's also not in a very dangerous area. So you can see on the ultrasound, there's some areas where there's some stuff. Um, it's an ultrasound and it's a brain, so it's not the best detail. Um, but they're able to kind of see, like, there's some stuff here. It's probably a bleed, but I'm going to suggest you follow up with neurology um, 
after your discharge. This is not an emergency. This is just follow. Okay. I was about to ask if this was some kind of emergency situation, but it doesn't sound like there was a any cause for now, concern. The, the, the doctor was the doctor was great. He was like, okay, listen, if we were if we were if we were up here, we'd be going downstairs right now. If we were down here, we'd be going to this guy. But with the bleed way down here, there's just nothing here that is going to cause a problem. Okay. So we said, okay, okay, great. And um, so um, so we go five more days at the NICU, no problems. They do one more ultrasound of his brain before he leaves, just to see had that ble- bleeding gone down or changed at all, and there was no change. So, okay, follow up in neurology. We just wanted to make sure nothing was growing or whatever. So, so we finally got to go home after a week. Wow. And now Kim, now, now Kim was able to come, come over to the hospital, um, after day two, but, oh man, a whole set of problems that, that you don't think that you have to deal with is my, my parents were in town and they were uh, able to help us out with our oldest son get him on and off the bus for kindergarten which yeah just started. wow um except like like you guys know as parents like your kids like they know you can't just ignore them so like we couldn't just not see our son for a week yeah either. how did so, you juggle that I, like like knowing that that you're that the parents are there that's that is fantastic were they already there to come see Liam and then all this just happened to fall into place anyway. Yeah. So my, my mom retired in June. So, um, she's been really visiting a lot. They live down in Florida, but they've been visiting a lot. Um, so, so she knew she was going to kind of be here. And then uh, my dad had already kind of prearranged uh, a trip. He works in the airline industry, flies a lot, makes it easy. Oh, wow. Okay. That's convenient. Yeah. So, uh, so they were already, they already planned on being up here. So they were here to help out with, with him. But um, our original plan was like, okay, yeah, let's just get a hotel right next to this hospital that our son's at, right? That's a no-brainer. But you also can't leave your your son at home. So to yeah. your question of how do you how do you juggle that? Um, for the first couple of days, I slept in my truck, um, and Kim took care of Connor for the first probably day or two. Well, well, the first day Kim was at still recovering um so the first day or two i was just in my truck there at the hospital sleeping and then uh oh my gosh after that yeah after after that we uh we started coming home at night so that we could you know so my mom would get connor off the bus we'd come home do dinner and then one of us would go back out to the hospital because uh, it complicates it some more you know you've got a newborn that hopefully you're trying to breastfeed right so how do you, you know, do you pump at home? Do you feed there? Do you pump and go back and forth? And then I still want to go and see him, but it doesn't make sense because I can't feed him. But then we're both ignoring our oldest son. We did a lot of trips back and forth is what we ended up doing. That's the short, that's the short answer. It's about um, an hour probably drive. I was about yeah. to ask how long it took. Yeah. And that's not, that's not pleasant in this Northern Virginia area. Um, no. Where so traffic's it, terrible. So it, yeah. So, I mean, it's just kind of like, yeah, get in the car and I'll go this time or you'll go or no, we'll both stay home and sleep. Luckily, the NICU has some really interesting policies. Um, like they kick everybody out for rounds just twice a day, I think, because they're just going to go through with the doctor and the nurses for change of shift and talk about all the patients. So you can't be around. Gotcha. So that was, I think it was at like, I don't know, six or eight or something in the morning. Time was relative after newborns, you're aware. Yeah. Um, you just, you, you so, lose all track of time to be on it. Mm-hmm. When it's relative, the, the tw- it's, it's, you lose all track the of 24 it. 24 hour clock looks really appealing. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, uh, luckily, they had some times where they were definitely kicking us out. So, it's like, we're going to kick you out for rounds. Um, and, you, you know, you kind of have to be here for this and we're kicking you out for that. So that kind of forced us to be like, well, there's no sense in us rushing to get there before 6.15 if we're getting, getting kicked out at 6.30. Um, so that kind of helped us like in the morning. But, yeah, I mean, you have that guilt of like, yeah, I could stay home and sleep in um, and not go see my son to feed him at 4 a.m. You know, they can feed him with a bottle that's there. They don't need me. Um, but am I, I don't know, am I sloughing off my parenting duties? do that yeah what did you did you have any guilt like that 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. of course. And, and you know, what do you do? I mean, I don't know. You one day you decide you're going to sleep, and you have a bunch of guilt about it. So then you spend the next day over there all day, and then and then you don't get any sleep. So you yeah. rinse and repeat for a couple of days. Because the rationality in your brain, looking at it afterwards, and you mentioned it earlier. There's no point in me being there if I can't feed him because I'm not the one breastfeeding him. But yeah, and you know, rationally, uh, I could be getting sleep so that I can take care of my other son who needs attention. Yes. But in the thick of it, I can't imagine that that is that clear. That decision is that Ex clear. Exactly. Yeah, because it's one of those where um, the. I, I was a big fan of Dr. House and they always made somebody made a reference on that show one time where they talked about waiting rooms in proximity to the person that you're, you're caring about there that you're there for. And that it doesn't really matter. Like even though you can't, it, there were times where I could hold him and there were times that I, that I, that I couldn't um, just because of whatever was happening. But it, it, for whatever reason, it just didn't seem the same even if I could be in the waiting room knowing that I'm just down the hall not seeing him, it felt like I was still there for him in a way that being at home, a phone call away, wasn't being there. An hour away, yeah, yeah. rather than walking right. through a set of doors. I yeah. totally get it. I totally get it. So, and uh, so when, yeah. Yeah, and when you brought him home, you know, I guess you didn't uh, up and leave the brewery right away. I mean, I'm sure, did you, or, or is that was that the plan for you to have Liam and then you no longer work. Well, so we, this is something that we went back and forth on. So we, what I'll say is we had made the decision that we were comfortable, um, with, with me not working, um, at the brewery or, or whatever else. I definitely didn't want to go and start working at another brewery, but, um, I, I definitely had kind of started feeling, uh, started trying to think about what was going to be the next step, um, at, at the brewery I was at and what we wanted to do and, and uh, kind of big, big picture stuff of how I wanted to advance my career and what was going to be the next step. Um, so we had kind of started thinking maybe I was going to take a break or, or, or did we want to start our own brewery or what was our, who knows what. Right. But the idea had crossed our minds that, yeah, I don't financially, we can make it work if I'm not, if I'm not working, if I wanted to take some time off or whatever. Sure. So, we had made that decision, and then um, shortly after, after all the NICU stuff had happened with Liam, um, we thought we were done. We, when we left the NICU, we were supposed to be in the clear. Um, like the whatever was going on in his brain was, who knows what, but it should be fine. And then um, the murmur should go away, and we hadn't had any more symptoms of the apnea. So we we thought. Um, that was it. I mean, like I said, we were literally like, I, I say checking boxes. because I think that's what Kim and I would, would call it. Okay. Yeah. We're just going to go see the cardiologist. He's going to say everything's fine. And then the neurologist is going to say, that's fine. And then we're done back to having a normal kid. Sure. So we went to the cardiologist was first, I guess. So we, we, we go to this cardiologist and I, uh, sorry not to dodge your question about my career. I didn't go back no, to work at all while I was in the NICU yeah. or before we had checked with any of the other doctors. So I just kind of told my boss, like, ah, I have no idea when I'm going to come back, but my, I know my son's in the NICU and I, there's no way I could function at work. So, um, so anyway, so we, um, we got to the point where we got to the cardiologist and, um, he was going to take a look at the murmur and said, yeah, I hear it. I, it should go away. But now that we're on day, 10 or 12 it normally goes away by now so let's go ahead hmm. and take a and take a look so we did an echo and um i think i think once everybody like once you go through a couple ultrasounds and echoes and, and whatever um imaging you kind of know how it goes like you know the person there can't say anything but like when they start clicking and measuring and doing stuff you're like okay you I don't remember what a heart looks like, but I don't remember those. Yeah. And the pictures that I remember. And like, and I see her like measuring them and figuring it out. So it turns out um, that he had these things called rhabdomyomas. And these are small um, tissues or balls of muscle tissue that have just kind of nested in his heart. 
And as scary as that sounds, they normally don't do anything at all. They normally just sit there until the body eventually just reabsorbs them and they go away. Now he has he has one that's in a little bit of an awkward spot. It's still there. It's it's kind of close to his aorta. Um, and these normally shrink and go away. Um and they're worth keeping an eye on. And the, the doctor kind of sat us down after all this was over and or after the to digest the the information. It was kind of said, so yeah, these rhabdomyomas are here, they're gonna go away. That's not an issue. However, whenever we see a newborn with rhabdomyomas it generally means you have a disease um, you have a um, condition called tsc tuberous sclerosis and he said is this is this the first time you're hearing this or and we were kind of like uh yeah you're the first person that's told us that like, okay so you're going to want to do some research on it uh, we don't have enough data to can like i can't tell you right now that you have this disease but generally when i see this from a cardiology standpoint it, it's it means this disease now what I want you to be aware of is that it's generally, while it affects uh, the heart and you'll have these rhabdomyomas, you're pretty much done from a cardiological standpoint. This is mostly a neurological disease, so it's time to, to go see a neurologist. Ah, okay. Now, well, well, funny thing, we actually did see a neurologist because they had noticed this thing on an ultrasound because of blah, 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 blah. And, and at this point, he was like, okay, so... Yeah, if there was something in his brain, that's the other thing that we use to diagnostically um, diagnose this disease. And that's so, and what you're talking about was that bleeding happening at the base of the brain. Yeah, what what we now know was not bleeding. What we what we turns out was uh, so so we finish up with the with the cardiologist. He says, go to a neurologist. We already have an appointment because of this other thing. Sure. So the literally three days later is our neurology appointment. We get there. Um, and how is and he doing the, through all this? Like like these past three days, is it is everything normal? It, he's great. He's eating. You know, we're going through all the stuff you struggle with, you know, like, you know, we're, we're dealing with we're dealing with pumping and feeding and normal and baby and stuff. diapers. And, yeah. yeah, it's all the. It's all the normal stuff. There is absolutely nothing wrong with him. He's, Interesting. He's great. So, um, so we go to this uh, neurologist, and it's one of those where you can just sometimes you just know when you're dealing with somebody who really knows their craft. You know, I relate it to to brewing because that's something that I really know and have really honed my craft on. And when I say that, like I can walk into a brewery and I understand how that brewery works. It's a craft that I understand. And, and that's how I really felt when we sat down with this neurologist. And here's why. So he says, hi. So we're here checking up on uh, an ultrasound that somebody took. So let's go ahead and take a look. And he looks at this thing for about a second before saying, I can see how someone might be confused into thinking that that's a bleed. Oh, and just, no. Just the, way, just the way he said it, it's like, oh. Uh, you sound Ugh. cocky, and you sound like you know exactly what you're talking about. But I will say it is it is all good news from here because he says so. What this looks like is this looks like um, a cortical tuber, which which means you probably have a disease called uh, tuberous sclerosis. We said yeah, our, our cardiologist just mentioned that, so we kind of did a little bit of reading on it. Um, I'll explain it some more for you, Alex, and the listeners in a minute. But luckily. Um, the doctor said, well, so here at this facility, we're actually the outpatient wing of, of our children's hospital. So we're just outside of D.C., Alex, and the the um, children's has an outpatient facility in Fairfax, which is really convenient for us. So that's where we were able to go and meet with this neurologist. Right. So we're talking with him and he says, well, actually, the children's national has a tuberous sclerosis clinic that rotates through their hospital um, once a month where they rotate through a whole bunch of doctors that specialize in this disease. The director of that clinic is actually here today. If you'd like, we can, I can have him come in here and he can tell you a little bit more about the disease. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we're like, okay, yeah, the leading person in this disease in this area happens to be two doors down. Yeah. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. I would think you'd jump right over the, all, all over that. Right. Yeah, so so basically, he sat us down and, and kind of told us about the disease, which was um, the uh, tuberous sclerosis is uh, means that Liam has a 
genetic modification on his TSC1 or TSC2 gene. Now, for people like you and me, those genes are in charge of producing proteins that stop soft cells from growing. So once things are done growing, they stop. And this protein is what regulates that from stopping. Gotcha. Liam's, Liam's body doesn't properly produce this protein um, because, huh. of this, because of this genetic um, condition. This was something we had to learn because genetic doesn't always mean hereditary which was something new to us because it's a gene issue, but it's not a hereditary gene issue. Oh, More things for us wow. to learn. Right. Because it's a problem with his genes, but it doesn't mean it's just a random mutation. Yeah. That's like, yeah, it seems contradictory almost like yes. when, the way you say it. Right. It's like when you say it, it's like, well, no, of course it has to be. Yeah. Well, no, I guess it doesn't. Yeah. It's like that thing is blue, but it's not blue. <laughs> so so uh so from there we um uh, what'll happen is in infants um w the first thing we normally see are rhabdomyomas in the heart um and uh they're normally not benign N nothing normally happens out of those okay. so that's good news um now what normally happens is this disease causes mechanical problems so as opposed to cancer, which produces cells that produce cells that take over cells and kill cells. This isn't very aggressive in that it doesn't take over existing healthy cells. But what it does do is it causes problems from just things being in the way. So it grows these tubers um, in his in his brain. They're you're called not, tubers. You're not saying that's tumors, right? Like I'm not. not I'm tr yeah, I try to enunciate. So tubers. And it's called that because that's what I mean. We're talking potatoes. That's what okay. we're looking like, right? That. Because they have to grow in the folds of a brain. Gotcha. So, so you know, kind of worm-like growths, but in a, in a tubular fashion. So they, grow, they the, these tubes will grow. And what will happen is they will cause, cause mechanical problems in his brain. You know, if, if you block on off enough roads to a certain area, then there's no way any, any blood flow can get to that area. Right, right, right. Um, so... As we learned about TSC, we know that about 90% of all of the um, kids that have TSC will develop epilepsy. Um, they will also likely develop other developmental disorders, um, slow uh, ADHD, all kinds of stuff. I mean, basically, it's just there's stuff growing in your brain. So anything that can go wrong is a is a possibility. But, but epilepsy being the number one. That's crazy. So. This is obviously a great reason for you to not <laughs> work and and certainly be yeah. there to help Liam. Uh, so let's dive into that sort of part of your life where you had this career um, and yeah. you made really damn good beer. I was a big fan of your work. Um, and you. now you are a stay at home dad. What was yeah. that choice like? You know, it was it was it was really easy, and here's why: because when we learned more about the seizures, one of the things that we learned is that the damn it, his his uh, there's nothing that's going to affect his life. He will live a normal age, likely, um, with this disease. But we're, everything that we're worried about is a quality of life issue, and the number one driver of quality of life in TSC patients is. How many seizures are they having while their brain is still developing? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's it. That's the only thing that we're worried about. So our concern is, obviously, Kimberly and I are going to get really read up on what seizures look like. We're watching YouTube videos all the time, and we're trying to spot them and you know, taking videos and watching other moms and parents with kids that have the same disease take videos of their kids having seizures so that we can learn. But there's no way I can expect any hired caregiver to to have that level of monitoring ability over Liam. Yeah, unless so, it costs a freaking arm and a leg. Right. It, it so, so for expensive. us, it's just a. So for us, it was just a matter of well, if if we give him to a caregiver and he's having, you know, we're looking at moms that are having their kids are having sixty five seizures a day. Oh my gosh. Know? So, so it's like, well, what if what if I'm not there and I'm not seeing it? And then we're completely messing up medication and all these things because 
we don't have a good idea of what's going on. Is that how you manage that? Is is it just like anybody else with epilepsy where you're just managing it with medication? Um, yeah. I mean, so so the way it works is um, kind of a piggyback on, on where we left off. Everyone's going to think we planned this, Alex. We'll just go to our next note, right? Yeah. So we're, um, luckily, the director of the clinic told us literally in the same conversation is, okay, now how old is he? Oh, great. Because he's under, I'm trying to remember what it was at the time, six weeks old, I think. Because he's under six weeks old, there's a, a study out right now. Um, because current course of treatment for TSC is sit and wait for seizures. And once seizures happen, give anticonvulsants. And there's a specific one that they give that's been showing a lot of promise recently. But that is the course of treatment, the, the sit and wait, which kind of stinks, but that's where we're at. There is a trial happening right now that's actually an epilepsy trial called the PREVENT study. And the idea is if we were to know that someone was going to have a seizure or seizures, if they were going to be epileptic at a young age, what would happen if we were to monitor their brain activity? And then as soon as we noticed a change in their brain activity, we give them an anticonvulsant before they have a seizure. Hmm. Yeah, I would think that's so, preventative, right, rather than reactionary. So that is the trial that we're currently enrolled in. Gosh, that's cool. I'm so glad to hear that you had that opportunity. And that's all because it's, that it's, guy was there. That's amazing. It is. And I not to not to bring it down, it is cool, but don't forget that there's that big possibility that we're going to get placeboed too. Oh god. Yeah, well, uh screw them if that's the case. Damn it. Yeah, right. <laughs> that is such yeah. a that's such a bummer. I didn't even consider that. So, so so luckily, so that was my big concern going into this whole thing is it's like, well, what I mean, are, is this a chance that we're going to be in placebo and luckily the doctor was really helpful with. He said, "Yeah, there's a chance you're going to be in the placebo." Luckily, I guess because the because this it's an NIH funded study and because they're all monitored so closely. Um the our doctor's point was even if you go and participate in this trial, which, which by the way, is in the Philadelphia, it's not local. Oh, um, if you go and participate in this trial, um, they will monitor you better than your insurance company is going to pay us to monitor. Oh, really? Your insurance company covers this, this, and this, you know, your annual monitoring and then this and this and this, whatever, you know, MRIs, things like that, whatever things come up. Because they're doing experimentals, they basically need to do full body scans of Liam to make sure that there's no other problems being caused or that they can have a medical record if something goes wrong of, uh, of, of some combination of things. But for whatever reason, or for all those reasons, they have to have very detailed records. So they are taking, uh, for example, they're taking an EEG of his brain every four weeks. That is not, we would get an annual EEG with... Uh, our insurance going through a regular program. Wow. Well, that's so it, yeah. So we could pay for that out of pocket. He says, but the the doctor said, luckily, even if you're in a placebo, you're more likely to catch the first seizure in the study. Yeah. Exactly. And once they have a seizure, it's standard medical care. Like everyone gets the same medication. They're not going to placebo somebody once they're having seizures. Okay. You get you you get the good stuff and. And so there's kind of like, well, there's no downside. There's just an upside and less of an upside. So, well, yeah. And, and here you are now you are yes. at uh, a situation in your life where you are a stay at home dad. You are taking care of the boys. What sort of lifestyle change was that for you? What are, how, how are you experiencing this? Is it good, bad? It's been it's been all the above, you know, because it's everything from like, um. Even even brewing, which is in, is in a career that pays very well, but it, just imagine going from the oh you have that extra expense of having another child and the expense of losing a job all at once. You know, it just seems like all the conversations are so financial because right. that's that's the nature of the beast now. You know, but as a stay at home dad, you you for me at least guilt is something that's that's so hard. To, guilt, to get over guilt in what way is it is it not being the provider or not being there for your kids or all the above so so luckily my wife has been very uh excellent at her career so she has climbed the the ladder very quickly which forced me to get over being the provider in our family years ago 
um, because of her success, which was great. awesome. But that's what allowed me to get into brewing to begin with. So that has been awesome. But and I've gone from this position of at least I, I make some money. I contribute to the family to now where like, ah, you know what? I feel like going and I'm going to grab lunch. I'm going to go out and grab lunch. And now it's like, well, now not only, not only am I not making money, now I'm spending money. Right. Yeah. So now am I, am I a double whammy, you know, burden to this household now when I, when I do that. And so, how, how does your wife feel about, like, have you talked to her about that? Yes. Yeah. This is something that's that, that we talk about. It's something that my wife and I are very open about is, you know, we, we still go to, uh, we still check in with our, our marriage counselor um, regularly and anyone out there who, who doesn't think they should or, or does think they should, should go find a marriage counselor, talk to somebody. That's my free plug for that. I love it. But um, yeah, that's something that we, we regularly talk about is kind of how we're feeling. We check in with each other and, that's something I've expressed is, Hey, I really feel some guilt about this. And of course she's very supportive in saying like, you know, things happen. You want to go out to lunch. Like, of course we're going to save money and, and we're going to make those decisions, but you can't carry that as guilt, you know? Yeah. Wow. But man, that, What a supportive uh, partner in life. Oh yes. Oh, she's amazing. That is so great. So, you know, here you are, you are, uh, you experienced, quite a bit of change in the past four months. You've had yes. some trauma uh, with dealing with your son's um, n- now diagnosed condition. Uh, yes. You have now moved away from working where you are now a stay-at-home dad. Uh, to any other dads out there who might be listening or pe- parents, people, anybody who are listening who may be experiencing something similar, what sort of words of wisdom would you give them? Um. Man, that's a tough one. You know, the the thing for us is I I remember um, at least with when our first kid with Connor and with Liam now, I remember thinking um, the parents that that have the really hard stuff that they have to go through with kids. I mean, like the, the kids that you're seeing on commercials and all that. And I and I always remember like what is that like as a parent? And I I don't I don't think we're anything close to that now, but. It's just kind of one of those like, yeah, now we have a rare disease and we're kind of in that group of, of what do you do? And um, and even now my wife and I are talking about it. It's like for us, it's just like, OK, the next step is what? Yeah. It's just kind of focusing on the next step. Like it, we haven't even started to think about like I, I don't I don't know what his I don't know what his life's going to be like when he's a teenager or or, you know, we say, we we might say things now like. Uh, you know, I can't wait to, to, to go fishing or do whatever. And, and we don't know what kind of quality of life or abilities he's going to have for that. But um, just kind of focusing on the next step and, and where we are now, he's, he's a perfect little kid right now and he has a huge personality and we have a lot of fun and he's got a bunch of smiles and that's what matters. And, and that's what we're focused on. And whatever happens from here, we'll, we'll take that as it comes. Well, good man. Yeah. Live in the present. Enjoy your time as a new uh, father again. <laughs> yes yes thank you yeah you're you're going through it all over again and uh you actually are are working on another project uh that we were talking a little bit about earlier do you want to take a second to share with people what you're planning on starting yeah so we're starting to get spun up another project so um we're working on a uh, dad to earth which is going to be um instagram and youtube Basically, I want to kind of chronicle some of the vlogs and some of the more dad-specific stuff um, that that guys uh, tackle out in the world. Uh, for example, I was just at a Costco the other day with both kids because we've been getting a lot of snow, and they had a snow day. And I just remember this mom, or this lady, seeing me with both kids at Costco loading up, and she was like, "Ah, wow, you're just super dad." And as good as that feels, you also have that guilt of like, you don't say that to every mom that's shopping with two kids, right? right? Yeah. So like, so like as much as I want to take, like, yeah, I am. It's like, ah, but should it be that way? It's crazy that that's like society's expectation. Like when they see women with a, like two or three kids, they're like, oh, she's just doing her thing. Like that's, that's her momming. Right. You know, or, or even, or even, or even more like you see, you see a mom with two or three kids. How many times are people judging her or, or giving her a hard time? Oh yeah. Whereas if if it's a, has, if it's a dad with two or three kids running around the store, you're just like, ah, what an involved dad. Yeah. My aunt has seven kids. Uh, well, this is my <sighs> aunt and uncle ranging from, you know, early twenties down to three or, uh, yeah, three or four years old now. And, uh, yeah, she's, 
you know, people I'm sure don't give her, don't look at her and give her the credit that she's due. She's super mom. Like it, it really is amazing to watch her be a mom to all those kids and raise all these kids, you know, along with my uncle, certainly, but yeah, that is, and you know, she's the one that stays at home. Right. So, uh, my uncle right. works and credit due. Yeah, so that's right. So that's, so that's one of the things that I actually want to be talking about in the channel too is is um, especially now like I – so I call myself Dad to Earth. And so on Instagram is Dad to Earth, YouTube Dad to Earth. And um, I, I identify as a dad and anyone else out there who identifies as a dad. But um, I don't – as much as I want to talk about traditional gender roles and, and kind of how that fits to what I do as a stay-at-home dad, it's also not something – I'm trying not – I don't want to alienate my channel as a, as a real big, um, I don't want my message to be a manly message. It's not for men to go out and be macho and, and be the, the stereotype dad mm -hmm. involved dad, I guess. Um, it's okay to kind of be a, a regular, a regular guy who's also a dad. Yeah. Like a genuine but, human being that doesn't. Yeah. I totally agree. Yes. So That's as much so as I love like, uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the products like Tactical Baby Gear, you know, where they've got like all the camo and the cool diaper bags. As much as I love all that stuff, it's just like, it's, yeah, but I'm also just a regular dad. Yeah, it's like, like I don't need it to be camo because I'm a guy. Like exactly, like I, it can just be like brown. That's yeah. Fine. Is it functional? All right, cool. Like <laughs> I just need something to put my kids' stuff in. That's great. All right, cool. So, so, so talking about stuff like that is what we're what uh, what I hope to be doing a little bit of. I love it. So, so again, can you give the plugs for where people can find that? Yeah. So, um, at dad to earth, T O D A D T O earth, um, on Instagram and, uh, YouTube. Awesome. And Very good. We'll see if I, we'll see if we grow out from there, but trying to, I'm, I'm still avoiding Facebook as much as I can. We'll see how it goes. Cool, man. Well, uh, let me know, uh, when it really starts going live and as you're producing content would love to plug it again here on this show to all the listeners out there please uh go check that out and our guest today has been brandon flanagan brandon thank you so much for joining and sharing this really inspiring story thank you very much alex thanks for having me on of course and for everybody listening at home you can listen to other stories of fatherhood by visiting the dad um, and again if you'd like to support this show please become a patron when you go to the dadchronicle.com, click the become a patron button at the very top and you will be taken to a spot where you can donate as much money as you want, at least a dollar. Um, and you can support the operational cost of the show. It goes a long way. And uh, Brandon, you want to say goodbye to the nice folks at home? Yes. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great night. All right. Take care, everybody. If you like this show, check out more great content at incastmedianetwork.com.